YouTube live stream right now and once it starts I will probably go ahead and close the YouTube window because I just need to confirm that it's up yep there it goes all right so I'm gonna close that um, and we are going to go over a few things today um, and the first few things that I gum I'm gonna go over may not be something that people want me to go over. There are certain things that you know I know you guys want me to go over, like uh, Tuesday's lab. So we'll definitely do that. And then there are certain things that you may not want me to mention again because um, I will sound like Dad nagging his children. And most of you are probably young enough to be my children, at least. <laughs> Give me a few years, and you know, most of you, most of the students in my classes, you know, can also be my grandchildren. All right. So it is time to start. I'm going to move my mind map over to the area that you can see. So there we go. So this is a this is a quick review of what I am going to talk about and what things you should understand already at this point. Uh, it's not exclusive. It's not. In, I sh I shouldn't say it should. It it is not um, exhaustive. That's it. Which means you know these concepts are the ones that I think are the most relevant to what we are going to talk about and also what we are talking about today. Um, so all of these concepts are important and I will do a demonstration. Um, so I'm going to do the lab on Tuesday, but I will not share the file. <laughs> so I'm all, when I'm all done, you guys, you know, if you want to use the same design, you're going to have to do it. And there are a few reasons why I do it this way. And, you know, quote unquote punishing people is not one of them. Okay, there's nothing about punishment, but I do want people to do it you know if they think that okay my circuitry didn't work or it wasn't quite like you know this one i would like to use this one i think it's really important to go through the process you know to um rep even to just to replicate a design because you know that will force people to use the tools you know configure the splitters and so on and so forth and i think that will help people um, get more familiarized with Logisim and the various things they can do with Logisim. Because remember, we're going to use Logisim for the entire semester. Okay, so getting familiarized with the tool is a long term investment as far as the time span of this semester is concerned. Depending on how much time we have here, you know, we probably will be able to get into borrow look ahead, which is a very similar mechanism to uh, carry look ahead. And we might even have time to get into signed versus unsigned interpretation of bit patterns. So that's kind of you know the layout of what I want to talk about today. But I do want to kind of go back to this huge, gigantic uh, mind map that talks about you know how to succeed in my classes. So it does not apply necessarily to your other classes. So there may be some other classes where you can you have to use a different type of a study habit. But for this class, okay, you know this is outlining you know everything that is that I think is important. Um, starting with prep, which is you know pre-reading the module. And you know, attend lectures. You know, like not just you know showing up. You know, on Discord or YouTube. Wait until I uh, I say okay, I'm gonna take road now. Participate in the road taking activity so they get one point in, and then you know, continue to do something else. You know, to multitask or even to walk away. Because once I have taken road, you know, some people may say I don't need to be there anymore. So attending lecture is not just taking role okay it's not about just taking role it is one part of it but it's all also about you know just being here okay you're with me on discord or this or youtube and be um and focus on the concept or focus on what i am talking about and formulate questions as we talk about these concepts there's also the lab component. The lab component is not really just busy work, as you, as you might have noticed. Uh, the lab component actually contains instruction as well, as well as reinforcement of the concept that we talk about in class. 
So that means, you know, what I have factored into the lab is people have already read the notes, fully understand it, review the video and stuff like that before they get into the lab. Now, sometimes I talk about some concepts and the lab is using exactly that concept from you know, the lecture right before. So in that case, you know, the prep is going to be very important because, you know, that means, you know, people already have a general idea of what I'm talking about, may have some little questions, you know, along the way, you know, connecting the pieces, but nonetheless, it is um, important. And then after class, uh, it is important to review, you know, reflect, okay, just kind of think about, you know, the material. It doesn't have to be like printing out everything and then read everything line by line. Nope, doesn't have to be like that. Because when you attend a lecture, you know, I think you should be taking notes. So as you take notes, you, know, you might jot down something like, okay, I need to look into this a little bit further. You know, I'm not seeing the connection between this and this and so on. Okay, so that those are the questions that you might want to get back to as you review the material. Now, when you're reviewing, you're free to watch YouTube again. I mean, you know, this is all getting recorded for a reason, right? So when you are attending the lecture, you might want to even jot down the time of a particular concept so that when you are ne reviewing, you can just go to those specific time spots, marks, okay, and just listen to you know, very specific segments of the lecture again and see if you can you know, get more out of uh, the content of the lecture. I have been told by some of my most successful students that they every time they watch the video, they get something different. They get something new because, you know, there there's just a lot of information. So sometimes, you know, they get, you know, maybe 50 percent, you know, when they are actually in lecture and then another 25 percent in the first rewatch of segments of the lecture. And then they get another 50 per 15 percent in the second you know, time you know, reviewing the lecture. So I'm just telling you this because that's what I have heard from my students. Okay, I got students you know transferring to UC Davis, to Sac State, to UC Berkeley, and you know the the best of my students would come back and tell me, you know the recording is helpful, but sometimes they have to watch it several times just to get everything out of it. All right, uh, okay. Um, I'm not so sure because you guys cannot see each other's access report. <laughs> I'll show you what I mean by that in just a little bit. Um, all right, so this is the so I'm I'm gonna stop nagging here, and instead I'm gonna turn into spy mode. So what is spy mode? Well, I can look into people, and when I look into people, I can click on. I'm not gonna do that. Okay, so I'm not gonna do anything to. Uh, potentially embarrass some people. So I can click on a particular person here and look at what uh, Canvas calls the access report, which is not nearly as good as the uh, the logging facility of Moodle, but nonetheless, it is actually quite helpful because I can see some people have, you know, very seldom or never l read the notes. Now, I cannot really say for sure, okay, because it is entirely possible that some people may have friends and go like, okay, I am going to get to this page, send you the link, and you know the other person goes like, okay, now we got the link, I print it out, you know, put it in my binder. So Canvas may never really have a single record or a single trace of that person accessing the notes. However, okay, I think in most cases that is not the case. When I see someone who has not accessed the, no the notes, it really means that person has not touched the notes. That is not how people would succeed in this class. Now, does it mean everybody needs to read the notes to succeed in this class? No, there might be some geniuses who does not need that. Okay, you know, if someone has an IQ of 130, 140, and so on, and pay attention during the lecture, that person may not need to read the notes or to rewatch the videos. But in general, reading the notes is important. So that's what I'm going to say, because I can find evidence whether people have read the notes or not. I'm just going to look looking into the notes right, I mean, uh, the text channel right now. I cannot show you my number, because my number would also show some other stuff that uh, may violate student privacy stuff. Okay, so I cannot show you that. <clears throat> but I can tell you that when I was a student, I took notes in class. I did not quite read the textbook ahead of time. 
most of the time I do because it's out of curiosity and then I will attend the lecture. Now this is like a long time ago. I'm old compared to most of you. So this is a long time ago. You know, we don't have online classes. We don't have tablets. Okay. Um, I bring a piece of paper, pencil, you know, to a class. I take notes. And most of the time, once I have taken notes, I can just review it right before the exam. And I'll be able to, you know, do fairly well in my computer science classes. So the question is, am I typical? I have been told that it is that is not the case. So that's why, you know, when I uh, wrote the student, the success, you know, um, mind map, that is not based on how I study. That's based on how I think most people should study. All right. So I just want to make that clear. Yep. Daniel is correct. Most people would be melting. I can actually tell sometimes from the questions that people ask, you know, some people definitely do not seem to show any evidence that they have read the notes, which is, mm, I, I think that's, I would just call it, I would just be very, very direct and say that is self-defeating. That's all I'm going to say. Um, I'm not sure, you know, oh, it does show how many times people access the notes, you know, from Canvas. It does show the frequency, not not frequency, it's a, it's a counter, basically. So if people have clicked on it from Canvas, you know, like nine times, it will show a, a, a digit of nine. But if someone has not touched on something, it doesn't even show up, you know, on that list. And I can tell that some people have not yet read, you know, uh, as I suggested, you know, read the, the, the module of the, that I'll be talking about. And some people have not even touched the modules that we have talk, talked about already. So, um, yeah. Well, okay, confusing is an interesting word because confusing means, you know, you are, there are several ways to interpret something and you need to find one way to interpret it. I'll be more than happy to address, you know, specific issues with confusion. I don't think my notes are confusing because I wrote it, right? However, I can see that how some people may see it as confusing because, you know, they, they cannot uh, make the connections. I'll be more than happy to add the connections as you guys tell me what you're not connecting. All right. Uh, yes, yeah, sitting on it for a while is a good idea, Jonathan. Um, your mind is kind of like a slow cooker. So, you know, you got to put in the raw ingredients, which is reading the notes, okay, you know, doing the labs, you know, um, and then you have to let it sit for a while. You kind of have, have to let it slow cook because your subconscious is, is actually doing most of the work. Uh, your conscious mind is important because you have to direct your conscious mind to input the material. Okay, that's like putting stuff in the slow cooker. But you have to let your subconscious, which is the slow cooker, you have to give it enough time to actually cook the ingredients. Um, well, this is, okay, remember what I said, you know, about, you know, how much time you need to spend for this class? I hope you guys remember because uh, the the lecture the number of lecture hours is 54, so we have 54 lecture hours, and then for each hour of lecture, you're supposed to spend two additional hours. So every week, or throughout the entire semester, um, you're supposed to spend what 160 you know, something hours. Um, 108? No, no, no. That's in addition to the lectures. So 108 hours in addition to the lecture, which is 54 hours. So you have 162 hours, right? So 162 hours, and that's excluding the lab too. Okay, so you have, you know, what? Uh, the lab is one unit. It has the same amount of time as the lecture. So that's another 54 hours, right? So it's 54 times four, which is 216 hours. So for the entire semester, people are expected to spend 216 hours on this class doing various things, attending the lecture, pre-reading, post-reading, homework assignments, exam, blah, 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 blah. Okay. And if you divide it by 16, okay, 200 divided by 16 is what? I'm going to use a calculator here. 216 divided by 16 
is 13 hours. So every week, people are supposed to spend 13 hours on this class alone. All right. So that's. I mean, I can't. I I can't really say anything else. You know, other than you know, you really need to put the time in. Um, and you know, really just have to let things stew a little bit, okay? You know, in order to take the information in. Um, yeah, this is not going to be an easy class. Um, I do not put any effort into putting my classes easy, but I do put effort into putting content into the class where you know I think you know, the content is going to be useful you know somewhere along the line of you you know taking some other classes or also in your career path all right so enough about that stuff I just want to re-emphasize you know what you know what should be done how much time to spend and also the importance of all of those things all right so what we're going to do now is I'm going to revisit the lab on Tuesday Okay, so I'm going to do the lab just like you did on Tuesday. And for those people who want to, you know, kind of copy the design, my advice is don't do it while I'm talking. Because you probably want to spend, you know, use your attention to focus on what I'm saying, you know, how I'm doing it and why or how these things are done. And then after that, remember, we got double lab, okay, you know, because this is a double lab class, but I'm combining the two labs for one single contiguous piece of time after the lecture for you guys to do your lab. So that means you've got plenty of time to replicate the design, you know, once the class is over. All right, so we'll go to the question. Okay, so we want to create the following main circuit. Uh, make sure the relative vertical positioning of the pins is as shown. So I don't want your know, x, y, and k zero to be, you know, in the wrong order vertically. So we we'll go ahead and create that in Logisim. Okay. So we got this is for x, this is for y, and this is for k zero. And then two of these need to be three bit wide, and you can multi-select before you change the properties. You know, this is actually quite handy as a feature sometimes. Now these labels x, y, and k zero, they are not really useful for anything other than you know just being displayed on the screen, so I can tell which one is which one. And then I'm going to go to wiring and get a few tunnels. So we need three of these. Okay, so we have duplicate, duplicate, and also duplicate. So right here, I'm going to pause and say it's important to identify where the connection point is for each component. So when you are looking at an input pin, the default connection position is right here. Okay, it is right here and it's right here. The reason why you know is when you hover your mouse pointer over, it will kind of you know show you a you know uh, they, they call this what. Uh, the text that hovers over, you know, to explain what that thing is for. And for a tunnel, this is the connection point. Okay, it doesn't quite show, but I think it, it, it highlights, it makes it a little bit bigger. Um, if I increase the magnification, we, we may be able to see it. Yeah, you can see how it, uh, a green circle ar appears around it. Unfortunately, my mouse pointer is also a circle that makes it a little bit harder to see. But if you have a regular mouse pointer, um, you know, it's pretty easy to see. All right, so we're going to make the connections, and I intentionally do it so that it has a problem. What is the problem? Well, you, all you have to do is to read the orange text. It says incompatible widths because, you know, we want everything to be three bit wide. So we need to make sure that the tunnels are also three bit wide. So we multi select, change the width of both of those, and now we don't have an orange line or you know, an error message anymore. So now we have to label the tunnels. Now the label for the tunnels is is more than just for show. Because everything, all the tunnels of exactly the same name, which is case sensitive, are logically connected together. This allows us to avoid um, having wires you know flying over each other throughout the circuit, which it kind of makes the circuit looks cleaner once we use this particular approach. All right, so I got that part done. 
and you then ask the question based on the reading of you know what a tunnel is so we got a few choices here um, the first one is a tunnel with a label automatically connects to components other than tunnels of the same name that is not true because it only connects to other tunnels of the same name the label is only used when the circuit is printed that is also not true okay because a tunnel is used or has value because it is for connecting all the tunnels of the same name. Uh, it is displayed as a visual label. Yes, it does. And it identifies connectivity between individual tunnel instances as tunnel instances of the same name are logically connected. That is also true. Yep, so three and four are the correct answers. So R Riley, I, I, I'm hoping that the pronunciation is Riley um, is correct. Moving on to the next one. Um, yeah, so for K2 and K3, you, you can use tunnels to, you know, to avoid you know, having all those flyovers. It may not be worth it because they're always, always going in one single direction. So it's not quite as bad as when things are flying all over and they're going back and forth in different directions. All right, so question number two. Okay, so this is what we also want to add to the main circuit. Okay, the key here is they're supposed to be in the same circuit. Okay, so instead of doing the same thing over here, you know, making three individual tunnels, I'm going to cheat. Okay, but when I say cheat, it simply means, you know, I am going to use a method that is more efficient. So I'm not cheating in the sense that I am having someone else to do my work. I'm simply using a more efficient way to get the same thing done. So you can multi-select a whole bunch of stuff, duplicate, and then you change the phasing all at the same time. So that makes it kind of, it saves you some time, okay? Not a huge amount of time, but nonetheless, you know, some amount of time. And then we have these three gates over here. Um, so one is an exclusive OR, one is an OR, and one's an AND. So we'll go ahead and pick out those things. Uh, under gates, we have one exclusive OR, and what is the next one? I think the next one is an OR, that's right. So we got an OR, and then we got an AND. And they're all way too big because, you know, that's the default, okay? Not a problem, right? Yeah, you know, we multi-select the whole thing, and then we make all the changes all at the same time. So first of all, we want these to have we want these to be three bit wise, so these are all multi bit gates. This is why you had a lab that was titled multi bit gates, because that's the concept that we're going to reuse, you know, in all of these designs. So all the concepts that you learned in previous labs, some of those, I should say, you know, a good number of those concepts are actually going to be reused throughout you know, the semester, or at least for the next few labs. All right, so we want the gate size to be narrow, and we also want to have only two inputs. So this is a pretty, you know, nifty thing to do, you know, is to, kind of, it really kind of saves time. But even if you don't do this, you know, there should be enough time to do the lab, assuming the, co the, the concepts um, were already understood. So the concepts is much more important than shortcutting, you know, how to use LogiSim. All right, so, and then on the other side, we have three tunnels. So I'm gonna do the cheat again, and just copy and paste these things over here. But this time, you know, I need to change the names or the labels of these um, tunnels. So let me look at the ordering, P, G, and Q. There we go, oops, there we go. All right, so we need to change this one to P, and then change this one to G, and then change this one to Q. All right, so I got quite a few questions, you know, from various people at this point of the lab. These terms, P, G, and Q, were introduced in the module, you know, binary number addition. So the question is, how do we find those definitions? The way to do this is to read the module line by line from top to bottom. At least do it once, okay? And as you go through it, uh, write your own notes. Jot down the definition of terms. 
that is how you filter and extract the definitions and you basically put all the definitions into a kind of onto a very small area of your own notes so that way you can kind of you know, really just look at all the definitions and see how they relate to each other because your definitions being kind of right next to each other is not going to be interleaved or spaced out by a gigantic chunk of text like in the module itself now someone may ask me but tech why don't you just do it for us you know because why don't you just put all the definitions in one single spot to save us the trouble because if i had done that and you didn't really go through the text, then you wouldn't understand the context of why these symbols are important, or, or semantically, in terms of the meaning, how they connect to each other. That is why I don't do it, because you know, the, the exercise is for you to do it, so that you basically gain an understanding of how these things relate, in addition to how they are defined. All right, so I'm going to go back to the text channel here. Okay, so nothing too important over there. All right, so P is defined to be X, uh, PI is XI or YI. And I can go from zero to two in this case, and that's why we can use a multi-bit gate, okay? That is the reason why we talked about multi-bit gate, because when the individual bits, you know, uh, P0, P1, P, and P2, they rely on XY in the same way, then we can use a multi-bit gate to do it. So because it's an OR, so we hook up, you know, P uh, from the OR gate. And then we just have to feed X and Y into the two inputs of the OR gate. So when you make the connections, you kind of have to make sure that you kind of make the connections correctly, you know, just because uh, things are coming from X and Y and you got two things connected to the gate doesn't mean that they're connected correctly. So, you know, just kind of make sure that you hook up these correctly. G of I is defined to be XI and YI. And we're gonna, uh, okay, so I made that sound because, you know, I should have moved this over a little bit here. It still works. It just doesn't look as good as I thought I would be able to make it. All right, so here's G and then here's Q. So Q, oh, this is not going to work, is it? There won't be enough space for me to do that. All right, fine, we'll move some some of these wires over. There we go. So whatever is left, which is Q, Q of I is XI exclusive or with YI. So yeah, I can make this work. It's going to be very ugly. Yeah, that's OK. I'll, Ugly is fine, you know, it just has to be functional. Um, yeah, so this is this will work. There are several ways to make it work, you know, in, in you know, I don't have to make it go around the whole thing. I just have to <laughs> do it like this. Yeah, I mean, you know, logically speaking it is still working. You know, I forgot to change that uh, to three bits wide. I'll do that in just a little bit. Alright, there we go. Alright. So by now I think most of you, all of you, should already understand what to do when you have incompatible widths, okay? You just have to change the bit width so that both components connected to the, to the wire have exactly the same bit width. The question now is which one should I use, right? Which one should I change? Because just because one is three, the other one is one, doesn't mean both of them should be three or both of them should be one. You kind of have to make sure that you understand why we have to change Q so that Q is three bit wide. There we go. All right. And I got a few questions about the notation, like, you know, um, P of I is defined to be XI plus uh, YI. That plus is not an addition. That is disjunction. Okay. And that was also discussed in the module itself. Okay. And that's why, you know, it's important to kind of take notes as you read through the module. Okay. You cannot rely on just the lecture alone to get all the material, even though I did mention it in class, okay? But, you know, reading it, taking notes, having a, your own notes to remind yourself what the symbols represent is important. All right. Yeah, you can you can just go all the way around and then put it over here. That works too. 
but logically speaking, this is fine. Given even though I have a flyover, that is that can be prevented. Okay, so this is all done. And the question is asking. So this is the other part that is kind of fun, um, I guess for some people, <clears throat> is you know when you uh, when people reattempt, uh, sometimes some of the values would change. Well, that's kind of by design. Okay, I don't want them to be exactly the same. I want it to change, just so that you know one you know it's not. Okay, it's not easy for people to copy from each other, even though you know there's a, only a finite number of combinations. But you know there's still a pretty good collection of those you know combinations. And two, you know I think you know this is one way for people to practice. You know redo the same thing over and over again until they they, they get the concept. There'll be some laps later on when we get to at least your know, floating point numbers where some people may actually want to do it over and over again, even though they got a hundred percent already. Uh, because the quiz or the lab would keep the highest score, which means you know when people reattempt, they get a lower score. It's not going to hurt the overall score, but it does give people extra you know chances of practicing on different values. So that's kind of the intention of doing it this way. So we have one zero one one zero one k zero is not used, so it can be anything. Um, so now use the poke tool to click the wire connecting connecting to the tunnel labeled Q. What is the second number to the right of the slash? Okay, so we'll do it here. So we're going to change the value of the input pin to be one zero one one zero one, and then we click on the wire connecting to the to Q as a tunnel. Right, click here, and it has slash zero here. Okay, well, if that is the case, this is this zero here is the answer. So we will put the answer into Logisim, and lot I mean not Logisim into Canvas. Canvas is strange. Okay, if you put in an answer that is zero, it will give you a warning and say that hey, you didn't quite answer this question. That is a bug that I have reported like years ago. Um, you know what, uh, when they first switched to Canvas, and to date it has not been fixed. Okay, so I cannot really do much about that. All right, I'm going back to the text channel. Um, in the lab, there was this line: "Your first job is to move the gates or tunnels to the right, so that the correct gate lines correct lined up with the correct tunnel." Yeah, you could do that too. It that's just you know, to make it look nice. So Kyle is correct. You know I. Did not read my own instructions correctly, um, but it doesn't need to be done. You know, it's nice to get it done. It looks nicer that way. Um, no, the zero 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 slash zero means you know the first the first one. Okay, let me switch so I can actually show you that there. So the first um, to the left hand side of the slash that's binary. And to the right hand side of the slash, that is signed interpretation, which we had we are going to talk about in maybe you know one or two lectures. But that's the interpretation, and the uh, instruction only wants you to copy whatever is you know on the right hand side of the slash. But it really is the base ten signed interpretation of the three bits. In this case, it's really obvious when you know zero 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 is going to be. Zero. So in some other cases, it looks kind of awkward because it gives you a negative number. Whatever it is, just type it in, and that is the answer to this question. Because um, this question is designed to make sure that you got you know the wiring done correctly. That Q is the exclusive OR between X and Y. So that was the intention of this question. Uh, <laughs> CIS student intern who wrote the code. Okay, so let's assume that is the case. Okay, the company in structure, which is a for-profit company, this is not a non-profit company. This is not the design hub where we pay students like minimum wage. Unfortunately, you know, this is a for-profit company. When they see a bug, they should fix it. I even sent in my suggestion to fix the bug because I already know what it was. Okay, because you know zero is can be interpreted as false. So instead of checking for the empty string, when you know it, when you have a text box that has nothing in it, they basically just check whether it's true or false. Okay, which works 
in some cases, because zero as a value, it can be interpreted as false in most scripting languages. The empty string is also interpreted as false, as is null, you know, um, you know, undefined. Those are all, they all can be coerced, you know, in a Boolean context to be false. So instead of checking for false, they should have just checked whether it's an empty string or undefined, depending on you know, what the browser does. It's a very easy change. I made the suggestion already, and they didn't do it. All right. Uh, yeah, Caltran Department of uh, Maintenance is not the only one. I can tell you that. Yes, um, there are many departments of the state government, and they are <clears throat> uh, the students. Basically, de facto, you know, are the de facto employees running those uh, operations. Uh, can you make them multiple answers? I'm not really sure what you mean by multiple answers. I mean, for this one, there's only one actual answer. Okay, moving on. I will keep an eye on the text channel, but as I, you know, move on here. Okay, now you have all the bits needed to compute the carry bits. Let's start with a new circuit K1, which means you need to use project add circuit to create a new circuit in Logisim, blah, blah, blah. To make the main circuit uh, simple and clean, use multi-bit input pins P and G and in the K1 circuit, which is illustrated here. You will also need K0 as an input pin. In order to make sure this circuit can be tested using a script, make sure that the relative vertical positions of P, G, and K0 input pins are as shown. The output pin K1 is not as much of an issue because it is the only output pin and it just needs to be on the right hand side. Uh, make students guess negative 3 would be wrong answer. I'm not sure what that means. I mean, you know, if you put in negative three here, that would definitely be a wrong answer because the correct answer, there's only one correct answer. So I'm not really sure what what that means. Getting back here. All right, so I'm gonna replicate the interface of the circuit first, and then we'll go back and fill in the circuit. So we go to project, add circuit, call this K1, and then we'll proceed, and I'm gonna do the absolute lazy thing here, because I know how to do it, right? So we do a control C to copy, and then we get to K1, and then we do a control V to paste. Now it does paste the labels also, you know, and you know some of these are wrong. So we'll go ahead and fix those, right? You know, so this is P, this is G, and K0 is already correct. Give four answers, make students choose a zero. That would be too easy. And I already said, I don't make things easy. Especially when it is not needed to be that easy. I don't understand why that would be a good thing. Having multiple choice for those things. I can only guess that some people can now, you know, just get basically retry the same thing over and over again until they get the right one. And that defeats the whole purpose of the lab activity. So I'm not going to do that. All right. And then Matt mentioned, just wanted to be clear from what I was asked yesterday, there's nothing being carried over via the tunnels of G and P from circuit main to K1. That is correct because we are making a sub circuit that we're going to use in main. So, you know, so main and K1 are two independent circuits. It's just that main uses K1. Okay, it's kind of like main is your main function in C and then K1 is a subroutine. They're two entirely individual subroutines. It just so happens that main calls K1, you know, as a subroutine that you know, that's invoked from main. So that's the only thing that connects main to K1 is one is a subcircuit used by the other one. Alrighty.
OK, so now we can actually work on the circuit. And I wrote down the circuit in my mind map. And I'm going to find my mind map. Oh, it's all the way at the bottom. There we go. All right, so you cannot see my mind map because I put it out of the screen already. Um, so K1 is defined to be G0 plus P0, K0. OK, I can just do a copy and paste. Um, just so that we can see it while we construct the circuit. So copy and paste, and this is just text, okay? So, oh, OK, sorry about that. Do this, and then paste. Nope. Um, that's because I forgot to do a control C on the other side. Control C, and paste. No, it still doesn't like it. For some reason, I cannot copy text from free plane and then paste it here. That's OK. We can just type it. So K0, K1 is G0 or P0, K0. OK, so I just put here because, you know, I might want to refer to this as I construct the circuit. Um, I just want to be sure because we ended main going to tunnels of PNG, but those are just receiving. We'll see, you know, when we get to that point, you know, you guys will see how this works. And I'll even go through the uh, the circuit tester, the test driver thing. So uh, we may not have a whole lot of time left today, you know, to talk about new concepts. So we'll see. All right. So, you know, we are using the usual, the normal you know, priority of operators. And as a result, you know, the implicit parentheses are around the AND operation. So the AND operation is here. And so we have to perform the AND operation first. And then whatever the output of the AND is, is going to be ORed with G0 by itself. OK? All right. So at this point, what are we going to do? Hmm. Well, we're going to pull some gates out, right? So we need gates. We need an AND gate. And we need an OR gate, like so. And then we'll take these two and change the um, size to narrow and only two input pins in this specific specific case. Um, and now we have to figure out what to do with it, right? You know, because we need to uh, do the AND first, which is between the P0 and the K0. So I'm going to do it the wrong way first, just to kind of explain why it is problematic. OK, so I'm going to do it the wrong way first. OK, come on. There we go. All right. So now we have a problem, right? Because, you know, P is a three bit input pin and this is a single bit gate. So why is there a problem? Because the equation only needs one bit out of the, the multi bit input pin P. So we need to get only bit zero out of P. So we need to get rid of this wire. We need a splitter, yes. So we need a splitter, OK? And so we go to wiring, because that's where splitters are found. So we get a splitter. Splitter is right there, OK. And I am going to do something here you know, to make it easy on myself you know, for the additional you know, circuits. So I'm going to make this one a 3-bit with 3 fan out. OK, now just because it has 3 fan out and you only need one of the split end doesn't mean the other two, you know, is wrong. OK, it simply means ah, I don't need it this time. So I'm going to leave it alone. So I'm going to do it like this. And then I'm going to move things around a little bit. OK, so we'll move this out here a little bit because G also needs to be split, OK? G needs to be split into the three individual bits as well. So we're going to split it just like that, too. OK, so we got a few. Um, yeah, you can use tunnels, um, even though it's not 100% necessary. Yeah, you can fan out to one, OK? But that means, you know, it's not, you cannot um, copy and paste, which is the whole idea of what I'm doing here is, is set up, set it up so that I, I can just copy and paste. Um, OK. 
All right, so now that we have it split, we can say, oh, this is bit zero as the label indicates, right? So we have bit zero coming out of P and we want to end P zero, K zero. And then we have an OR out here. So the output of the OR is our actual K one. And the output of the AND gate is one of the things that we want to OR. But the other thing that we want to OR is just Z, G0 itself. This is G0 itself. So we'll take it out. Yeah, it looks kind of ugly. And that's OK. It is entirely functional. There we go. So here's my K1. And also, you know, just like you know, for any class, it is usually a good idea to save the design once in a while, just so that you know if you get a power fail, you know, or for whatever reason, you know, something crashes, uh, you're not going to lose it. So I'm going to save it once at least. Uh, we'll call this uh, 3xv3ca. You know, I think that's the. Oh, by the way, you can save it. You know, in the name, you know, of the uh, file that is that is being substituted then you won't need substitution you know when you're using test driver so that's uh that's you know that's kind of handy to know okay so what we got k1 now and let's get back to the question so the question is saying to test a circuit so that the output of k1 is one if and only if two of the following inputs are ones so if at least two okay i should i correct myself if at least two of the following are ones, then out, uh, K1 should be a one in the main circuit. So edit the appearance and so on. Okay, so now we have to hook it up in main. So we, let's go to appearance. Okay, so the you know, first thing to do is to check, make sure the pins are indeed correct. This is P, this is G, and this is K0, and this is our output pin. All right, so everything looks good. We go back to main. And then we use the, what we have just designed. So we'll go to K1, you know, put it here. Um, this is one way to do it. If uh, the instruction doesn't quite say, you know, to do it that way. So I'm going to put it here. So I'm going to test the circuit here. Let me zoom in again. All right. So the, the question says, you know, if, um, no, actually, I take it back. I take it back. Because you know the, it has to do with x zero y zero k zero, so we do have to do it in main because you know uh, we ha we don't have visibility of x zero y zero in the in this particular circuit, so we do have to get it in main and hook it up correctly. All right, so um, there are several ways to do this. You know, for people who want it to look nice, you can just go ahead and you know copy and paste the tunnels just for the purpose of um, yeah you have to drag it carefully you have to drag it where there is something and we'll change the facing there we go all right so now we're gonna you know feed p to the pin okay let's draw that one more time hmm There we go. And then we hook up G. And then we hook up Q. Nope, not Q. <laughs> we need K0. There we go. So get rid of Q. And we need K0. So we can... Yeah, some of you are going to frown because it looks really ugly. There we go. So now we got the circuit, you know, uh, hooked up to be tested. And we can see that, you know, at least two of the three are ones between X0, Y0, and K0. And then the output of K1 is indeed a one. All right, so I'm going to read the text channel here. Nope, this is not a half adder. A half adder does not apply when we are dealing with a carry look ahead adder. It only applies when we are dealing with a carry ripple adder. 
um, the one with K1 as the output. This is this is K1. I mean, this circuit here computes K1 once we have P, G, and Q0 computed. Um, are tunnels like variables? No, tunnels are not like variables. They are they're kind of unique in the circuit, you know, design, you know, be, because every single tunnel of the same name, they are actually the same thing. So it's just a convenient way to uh, make a circuit so that we don't need a whole lot of flyover stuff. So I wouldn't compare them to variables. Um, they are legit just a tunnel for the wires to pretend to pass through. Uh, OK, so yeah, it's basically just to make it easier. It's I think the best way to describe it is it's a macro. Um, most of you probably are not introduced to macros like pound define, uh, which is a C preprocessor feature. Um, but I'm assuming most people don't really use those anymore. But it's kind of like a macro. All it does is to say, hey, if you see this, it's the same as that. That's basically what a tunnel is for. All right. All right, so I see that some people are lost, but until they tell me how they're lost, there's nothing I can do. So you guys will have to help me by telling me which part is not connecting. Okay, so okay, so stuff is not very specific, and you know, so I can't really address you know those issues unless I know more specifically you know what stuff we are talking about well you can refer to the terms right you know you can refer to the terms you can refer to the name of the gates you can refer to the labels you can refer to the name of the tunnels which part right I mean you know if you're saying everything I really got nothing to say if it is everything, but if you are more specific about, you know, and you can tell me, you know, which part is not connecting, you know, why are we doing X, Y, and Z and make it specific, then I would be able to help to, you know, try to answer the question. It is not a half adder, it doesn't need a name, it is a circuit to compute K1. It is Okay, so I am going to do something that is going to be super annoying. It's going back to the nodes. It's doing this. This is all the circuit is doing. Give me G, give me P, give me K0, and I'll compute K1. That's what the circuit is doing. A half adder is needed to make a full adder, and that was only useful when we are dealing with carry ripple adders. When I talked about carry ripple adder, I specifically said this is not going to be applicable to your lab because your lab is all about carry look ahead. All right. Right. So, you know, this is what I was hoping you guys to make a connection is to use this formula to implement this circuit here, that was the whole purpose of this lab, is to turn the text, the formulae in the module into actual gate circuit, you know, gate logic circuit. That was kind of the, the whole idea of this lab. It is not about just rereading, okay, it is how you are rereading. And Jonathan is correct. The whole idea of why we do not want to use carry ripple adder, even though it is seems to be kind of simplistic and things are pretty stackable, is because it's a linear time of you know, ripple effect. So the longer, the more bits you want to add, the longer it's going to take for the last carry bit to settle. So it takes longer, which is not a very efficient design. All right. Q was just for question two, 
and later on we'll need it okay yeah because Q is in the addition uh, module for a reason right we need Q in order to combine it with K to compute the sum so that's why we need the Q it doesn't mean it's immediately needed for K1 K2 and K3 you know the, the the lab doesn't say that you have to use those because K1 only can only rely on PG and K0 so Q is not used at this point um, can you explain again why we use only use one bit for each splitter in K1? Okay, sure. So that goes back to notation. What is G0? What is G0 referring to? What is that subscript of zero doing? This is something that we introduce when we talk about base conversion. Bit zero, that is correct. So Perry is correct. It is bit zero. How many bits do we have in bit zero? Just one. Very good. And what about P itself? How many bits do we have in P as an input pin? Exactly. Since we have three bits over here on this merged side of the splitter and we only need one of them, that's why we need a splitter to extract just the one bit that we need for the AND operation because the formula only calls for one single bit, which is just G0. So this is all about you know going back to the notations, right? You know, the notation of using a subscript to designate a particular bit is something that we already introduced when we talk about base conversion. And I'm using the same notation here. Okay, very good. So it is important to ask questions. Um, but it's also important to ask questions that are, that are specific. Okay, so the the question that was asked earlier, you know, of why we need a splitter, you know, was specific enough that I can explain it and reconnect it to concepts that we have already talked about. So this is why it is super important for you guys to maintain your own way of keeping track of the notations. Because if you don't, if someone is not understanding the notations of what a subscript means, you know what is, uh, what is x y without any operator in between means, you know, what is x plus y in the context of a boolean operation, that person's going to be lost. Okay, there's just no way that person can continue with this class and get a reasonable grade out of it. Okay, so notation is very important because it is, it defines the syntax. Okay, if you think about this stuff here as a programming language. We are talking about the syntax, okay? Not understanding the syntax is it's not going to work in a programming class. So it is a, similarly, it is important in this class to understand the syntax. Yeah, splitters are two-way, so you can merge, you can split, you know, doesn't really matter. That was in, okay, I was, okay, to answer the question of, you know, I think it will help a lot if we have a reference on what we are trying to convert to a circuit. That was the lab. The lab is basically saying, you know, use, you're, you're trying to output K1. These are the inputs. So, you know, you should look up the definition of K1 and then see how you can connect, you know, these wires or these input pins to K1. That is the reference. And I was hoping people would make that connection by themselves because once you have read the notes and understood the notes, you know, that connection should be fairly obvious. I mean, I'm not going to sugarcoat it, okay? I'm just going to say what I mean and I'd say it should be fairly obvious once people have read the notes and understand how K1 is defined in the carry look ahead section. I mean, that's, that's all I have to say about this. Doesn't mean that I won't spend the time to try to explain some more, but I, I really think that you know that connection is fairly obvious. It's 
Well, the question seems to suggest that you know the syntax is not understood because you know the necessity of a splitter to take the input pin, which is three bit wide, to extract one bit out of it seems to relate to not understanding what is p subscript zero. It doesn't mean it's the only way to explain that question, okay, or the necessity of, of why that question was even asked. But I, it would seem to me that, you know, not understanding that subscript zero, you know, is part of the reason why that question was asked. All right, so I'm going to take row now. Um, so we're going to take a short break from this material and we're going to take row. All right, so I'm going to put the row taking window into here and give you the answer first. All right, so there are two possible answers. One is minnow end, and then the other one is subtrahend. There we go. So any one of these two can be used, you know, for this particular road taking activity, and you should be able to participate now. So I'll give you guys some time to um, deal with the road taking activity, and then we. Um, the Ian's question is, I attempted to answer that question when I gave you guys the pseudo C code. Oh, it's still locked? Oh, the time is off. Oh, never mind. All right, so let me change that. Sorry about that. I'll give you another 10 minutes to answer the, those questions. Yeah, that was that was my fault. I did not, you know, update the time correctly. There we go. All right, try that again. Well, Ben whether we can finish K2 and K3 depends on how many more questions I got I'm getting you know, from here to there. Just scroll back and find my text message. Yep, there you go, both Minuend and Subterhand will both work. Thank you. All right, so I'm going to continue with answering the questions. So I'm going to go back to the question that was asked earlier about T of M plus one, you know, what that notation means. I attempted to answer that question by writing a C um, pseudo C program. I'm not even sure whether that's going to compile or not, but it has a double loop, you know, and within the loop, you know, it will perform the operation. It's going to come, it's going to come up with the um, notations, you know, that is, um, that I have in the notes. So that was explained when we got to the end of binary number addition. So the question is, okay, so the question that I have is, is Okay, first of all, did you take a look at that C++ code? Okay, so that's the first question. The second question is, if you have, then um, do you understand that C++ code? Because it's C++ is using just a double loop control structure. It's not recursive in any way. So that really should be something that you guys understand because CISP360 is the prerequisite of this class. So... So that's going to be my question is what about that C++ code is not understood because you know that is basically the expansion of the notation that was quoted earlier at 930, 959. 
So that is that. All right. Okay, so we are continuing with our lab today. Um, so you might say, you know, but tech is taking you almost an entire lecture session to get this done. How can you expect us to get it done within one single lab session? Well, I'm also explaining a lot. Remember, I'm nagging a lot along the way too. So, you know, and you guys don't have to nag someone along while you're doing your lab. Who are you going to nag, right? I mean, that is supposed to be done before the lab. I'm not sure whether that's going to work. You know, I do understand, you know, from a parent perspective, nagging does not work. But seeing people not doing something productive um, is something I can't stand. So, oops, not that. And note that I'm not saying anyone is lazy, because lazy is implying a will to spend as little energy as possible. Okay, you know, people can be spending a lot of time studying, but it has to do with how we study too. So it's not really just work harder. It is about, you know, how we put in the work. That also has a lot of impact to whether the material is going to be understood or not. All right. So now we are moving on to K2. Okay, there we go. So we look into notes, right? I mean, you know, everything is really here in the notes. Um, and the idea is, do you know where to find it? So K2 is right here. It is this particular equation here. So we're going to copy and paste it. Okay, there's no quick and easy way to copy and paste from here to there. Actually, there is. <laughs> I'm going to do it. So we go to tech command. Oh, it's not showing. There we go. So we are going to take the portion that is important to us, which is this section here. So here's a copy and paste. Nope, doesn't like it. <laughs> so the problem is with uh, Logisim not liking to be uh, pasted. It can only use paste when it is copied from within Logisim. It doesn't take anything outside of Logisim, unfortunately. All right, so we're going to have to copy it from my other window. So just give me a second here, because I think once I copy this, it will make it very, it will make it more obvious of what we need to do. All right, so the next one is P1, P0, K0. All right, so now we have the equation. We just have to implement that equation over here. All right, so I'm looking at the text channel. Um, oh, okay, the URL bar, okay. All right, so we're going to take a look at this, and we know the wiring in between is not going to be very helpful. So I'm going to erase everything in between, and then just go ahead and redo everything. So we need two AND gates, because this is one AND operation. This is another AND operation. So we get the gates, and we basically get two AND gates. And then everything is ORed at the end, so we pick up one OR gate. So we make all of these, you know, the smaller design. And we're going to change these to have two inputs, but we're going to have to readjust that in just a little bit. But at this point, it's going to be OK. Uh, G1 is by itself going to the OR gate. OK, so that's not an issue. P1 and G0 needed, need to be ended. So we're going to take up this one to end P1 and G0. So P1 does align here. So this is P1 right here. And needs to be ended with G0, which also lines up. And this is purely by coincidence. It was not by design. 
And the next end is P1, P0, K0. So I'm going to take this one. But because we have two, three components, sorry, we have three components to be ended together. So we have to change the number of inputs from two to three. All right, so we'll go ahead and put it over here. There'll be some flying over stuff going on because we need P0, uh, P1, and also uh, K0 in this case. All right, so that is implementing this particular AND operation. G1 is by itself, okay? This doesn't need to be ANDed, so we're just going to have to take it out of here, uh, over here. And this is the OR gate that is supposed to OR three things, right? This is one component, this is another component, this is another component over here. So it's going to need three inputs. The output is what we need as the output, and I should change the label of the output to K2. So let me do that right now. So the output is K2. This is really just for display purposes, you know, but I still don't want it to be confusing. So now we just have to hook up the stuff that need to be ORed. So here's one, two, and then this is the third component to be ORed. And now we have K2 done. So we switch to appearance, and it looks like this. Double check. This is P, this is G, this is K0, and this is our output pin. So everything looks OK. And I think it is actually quite important to kind of label this as our K2, because otherwise, K1 and K2 will look exactly the same um, until you click on it to find out which one it is. So this makes it kind of more obvious and less likely that we'll make a mistake later on. All right, so let me check the text channel. OK, no new questions. And now we just have to do K3, same process. Go to uh, project, add circuit. This is K3. And then we can copy and paste from one of the existing circuits. So control C to copy and uh, control V to paste. OK, we got some questions. Can I see what K2 looks like one more time? All right. So this is K2. Uh, it Yours may not look exactly the same because it kind of depends a lot on how you fly the wires over, you know, how you position the AND gates and so on. So it, it may not look exactly the same. As long as you have the right connections, it will still be fine. Okay, And this defines what the connections are supposed to look like. So there is that. So can I use two OR gates? Well, if I use two OR gates, then you increase the propagational delay. So we, we should use one single OR gate with you know, three inputs in this case. All right, cool. Now we get on to K3. Mm -hmm, sure. So once we get to K3, we're going to gut the interior. I mean, the OR gate, we can probably keep it, you know, for because we just have to increase the number of input to uh, four inputs. Um, but we do want to get rid of all the wires because otherwise, you know, as we change the gate to have four inputs, it's going to do something funky with the wires already connected to it. So we just, you know, don't want that. We want to make it kind of clean. All right. So now we're going to write out the equation first for K3. All right, so K3 is G2 or P2, G1. And this, you know, another thing you can do is to relate, you know, how these things, you know, can be generated using the, the big and big or, you know, formula, uh, because, you know, that should, you know, work out in this case too. And then the last one is P2, oops, P2, P1, P0, K0, like that. So obviously this one is going to be kind of, you know, there will be a lot of wires. Um, so we'll go ahead and deal with the most complicated one first, which is P2, P1, P0, K0. Um, we need a bunch of AND gates. So we go to gates, pick out AND, and we need three of these today uh, for this particular circuit. So we'll pick out three. 
And even though one of these is going to have four inputs, I'm just going to use um, the narrow design deal because the other two, you know, would use fewer uh, inputs. So we're dealing with this one with, which needs four inputs. So we'll change this one to have four inputs. And we'll put it where it is convenient, which is up here, because its job is to end P2, P1, P0, and then also K0. So K0 is the only one that needs to fly over a little bit to get to this end gate. The other ones are pretty convenient. It's already here. And P0 goes to this particular pin. And then K0 is the only one that is kind of out of the way. So we'll connect it like that. There we go. So now we have the other AND operation, which is P2, P1, AND G0. So we'll need both of these. Um, nope, I take it back. We'll need these two and also G0. So, and it has three inputs for this AND gate. Change the number of inputs to three. And I'm going to put it over here. All right, so we are, I'm just looking at the design and trying to figure out. Okay, so G0 is needed only once here. Okay, so we can. All right, so here's G0. And then we need P1. This is P1. And also P2. And this is P2. Yeah, I have quite a bit of flyover already. And then the last AND gate is to implement P2 and G1. So it only needs two inputs. There we go. And then we're going to pull P2 from here. And it also needs G1, which is this one over here. So the, re the how you identify which bit we are dealing with is already labeled in the splitter. So that's how we can quite easily and quickly tell which one we are dealing with. And this is G2. G2 is by itself. It does not need an AND gate. So now we just have to OR all of these outputs together. OK, so this is the first one. And here's the second one. And here's the third. And this is our last one. And voila, we got it. All right, so uh, switch to appearance. And oh, interesting. It actually copied the label, too. So let's go ahead and change this to K3. Go back to main. OK. Um, let me see. I think we got some questions in the text channel. All right. Yeah, having wires everywhere, you know, it's okay. You know, occasionally I make really messy designs too. So making it clean is not really the primary objective. It is, it's really just understanding the concepts. That would be the primary objective. All right, so let me go back to the lab and see what else I need to do, right? So how many AND gates are needed in the circuit K1 to compute K1? This means do not include the AND gates to compute P, N, or G from X, Y. So there's only one AND gate needed in that case. In K1, this is question number four. Now that you can create a sub-circuit for K1, do the same with K2 and K3. That's what I just did. Using the carry look-ahead formulae, so that well, to me, at least, it clearly indicates to refer to these equations because these are all in section six, which talks about carry look ahead. Um, let's go back to here. Um, when this step is done, the ex in the explorer the explorer explorer pane of logic sim should have K1, K2, and K3 as available components. In like in the following diagram. Um, Note that three circuits, all three circuits should be should use P, G, and K0 as input pins. This step may take longer because K2 and K3 are distinct from K1 and increasingly complex. The equations of K2 and K3 can also be found in the notes. 
Once you have the k values, what else do you need to compute the sum, the s bits? Well, that's what the q is for. Because the, the, the equation to compute s of i is q of i exclusive or with k of i. So that's why q is the answer in this case. All right, so this part is not a question. It is asking you to um, save your file, right? You know, just so that you can use it today. Um, and uh, and this is also a, a way to test it. So you could never get the file to work. <laughs> OK. All right, so um, let's test it, you know, and then we'll be done for now. OK, so I'm going to right click and save link as. OK, so this is how we save a file instead of trying to open it from inside the browser, because that's not going to work. All right, so we save the file. And then we use this long command. So I'm going to copy and paste it and modify as necessary. And the other thing we also need to do is to save this again, because it has all the components now. So we save it. And I'm not really sure where it's saving it to. So I'm going to use save as. OK, it does save it under temp. OK, so everything is under temp now. All right, so let me get my uh, command line interface, the big one, the one that you guys can see. There we go. <clears throat> And we can now paste the command and go ahead and change, you know, whatever we need to change in this case. So the path to Logicium is basically you have to specify where you store Logicium 310.jar. And to me, you know, it is under the home directory under documents CISP 310. That is where Logicium 310 is found. Uh, test driver is downloaded into the temp folder and I'm already in the temp folder. So this one does not need a path you know, because it, it's in the working directory. Um, whatever working directory you're in when you execute a command is called the working directory. So for to refer to files in the working directory, you do not need to have a path to specify it. Um, and then dash tdy, blah, blah, blah. OK. And for the substitution thing, you know, in this case, I don't really need a substitution because I named my circuit 3x3ca.circ, so I don't need it. But if you name it something else, you, you can you know, basically you know, uh, use the substitution. But in this case, I don't need it. Are the three circuits supposed to plug into main like this? Uh, well, they're components. Yep. That's how it's supposed to be connected. But you know, try not to show your solution you know, in the text channel for the whole class. All right. So now I press the Enter key, and this is the output. All right. All right. Can you please write down the formula for main circuit? Mm. That's part of what you're supposed to do. <laughs> That's what today's lab is about, OK, is to make use of K1, K2, and K3 in the main circuit so that we can get this whole thing done. All righty. So let me open up today's lab. And today's lab has two parts. OK, so part one. Uh, OK, I shouldn't say that because it's it's its own name is part two, but has a um, quiz you know, type of uh, component. And it also has a file submission component. So the file submission is you know having you to turn in your actual 3x3 three three carry look ahead adder uh, with x, y, k0 as input and the sum as the output using k1, k2, and k3 as the subcomponents. And then this one is really just the, um, uh, the quiz portion, which you are familiar with. Um, so that's it. 
Um, oh, you do need the access code for this one, so I'm going to give you the access code now. Three X three B is the access code. Well, we have extra time, you know, built into the way the labs are arranged. So you, so the lab is supposed to be eighty minutes long, and because we have a double lab, which on campus is going to be eighty minutes for the first lab and then eighty minutes for the second lab with no overlap. But since we are online, you know, I'm not going to enforce and so and say that, oh, you're supposed to be in the first lab. You can only use the first 80 minutes and you're in the second one. You can only use the second 80 minutes. So I just basically combined the two labs into one gigantic long three hour long, basically, you know, lab session. So we've got extra time built in already. All righty. Uh, just to clarify, unlike your example, we should make the tunnel pins go directly across the correct gates. The tunnel pins to go directly across. Well, any way you want to do it is fine as long as the connections are correct. So I'm not really sure whether that answers Jonathan's question. Um, Justin says, I have all three files in current folder, and when I try to run your test script, it doesn't work. Um, it seems, from the error message, it seems to complain that test driver CA3x3.circ is not in the file, in the folder that you're that you're using. That's why it's having its error loading circuit file or the file the file is corrupted. But the reason is you know it cannot load it. Mm. Alright, so I can look into that Justin um in just a little bit, but I want to see if there are any additional questions before I end the live session, the live, um, the screen share session. All right. Doesn't seem there is the case. All right. So I am going to stop streaming to YouTube and get out of um, the voice channel. Um, I'll go out, go away for maybe a few minutes, and then I'll be back to answer questions starting with. Um, Justin's question.